Welcome everyone and welcome to today's um, virtual accelerator presented by Startup Canada. Uh, we are going to begin with a few opening remarks. If I can quickly ask if everyone can please mute their microphones for the rest of the duration of, of our session until we jump into the breakout sessions. Uh, that would be great. Uh, we are welcoming a few people um, over the next few minutes that we will continue to, to enter, but we have a jam-packed program, so we are going to, to kick things off with, with a few introductions. Um, so welcome everyone. My name is Kayla Isabel and I'm the Executive Director here at Startup Canada. Um, to begin, we wish to acknowledge the land that I am on and my team is on at the moment um, is on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. Uh, to support entrepreneurs through our program this year uh, and in anticipation for our Canadian Export Challenge program this September, um, startups and scale-ups are eligible to win prize competition funding, in-kind support, uh, and we're really supporting entrepreneurs during COVID-19 with a series of boot camps and virtual accelerators, just like this, uh, available in partnership with our partners, UPS and EDC. Um, so thank you to those partners for making this type of programming possible. Um, as we know, the last couple of months have been incredibly challenging, uh, particularly those that are looking to scale into global markets, navigating a very challenging exporting environment um, that is already, um, you know, to, tends to be a bit of a barrier to entry uh, to many entrepreneurs. Um, so we're really looking to provide both startups and scale-ups with resources, networking, um, and really giving them all of the tools that they need to scale and, and put Canada on the, on the global stage. This particular uh, virtual accelerator, um, the Scaling Indigenous Businesses Globally, um, is a, an event to de designed to support Indigenous entrepreneurs who are thinking about, working towards, or who are already exporting their products and services. So this session is for entrepreneurs at every stage of their, their entrepreneurship journey. Um, the next hour and a half is going to be a mix of presentations, Q&A opportunities, and small breakout sessions for more in-depth conversations with our facilitators. Um, so just in terms of a few housekeeping items, um, on the very bottom of your screen, you will see um, a chat function. So if you click on that chat function, you are welcome to um, make a, a comment to everyone in the meeting. Um, so if you'd like to introduce yourself, say a quick hello, including your name, where you're joining us from, and maybe a little bit about your business, you're more than welcome to engage. Um, and, and ensuring, you know, if there are networking opportunities, opportunities, you want to connect with other attendees or panelists, uh, we'll have plenty of opportunities for that. I will be moderating the chat function. So throughout the presentations, if you do have targeted questions, um, I will relay those to our, our fabulous panelists um, and make sure that we can get you some answers on some of your pressing uh, concerns, pointing you to the right resources throughout the duration. Uh, we will have two presentations at the beginning, and then we will jump in to roundtable sessions. So you are welcome to keep your video off if you prefer and just speak verbally. You're also welcome to include your video um, if you'd like to network face-to-face -face with other entrepreneurs. Uh, but that will be coming later in the programming. So just a heads up, after our two presentations, uh, we will have that, uh, have that available. Uh, in terms of um, introductions, so we do have a jam-packed schedule today uh, with a number of speakers. Uh, and I'm really delighted to introduce everyone to our first speaker, um, Todd Evans, who is the national lead for Indigenous exporters at EDC, one of our really fantastic partners here at Startup Canada. Uh, as the national lead for Indigenous exporters, Todd's role is to advance Export Development Canada's understanding of the needs and challenges of the Indigenous business community um, and to help develop a longer term strategy for serving this market. Todd is responsible for EDC's engagement with external stakeholders and Indigenous clients in particular. He works closely with his EDC colleagues and senior management to support the growing export needs of Indigenous businesses. Um, so his presentation is going to be um, jam-packed with, with really phenomenal resources that EDC has been assembling um, over the last number of years. Um, originally from Newfoundland and Labrador, where he is tuning in from today, uh, Todd is, a pr uh, is proud of his Miquam culture. He is a traditional powwow dancer uh, and plans to spend a lot more time on the powwow trail when he retires. So we definitely look forward to seeing that. Todd. Uh, our second speaker today is Paul Emile McNabb, who is the Director of Business Development and Strategic Initiatives for the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business. Um, Paul Emile rejoined uh, the Council on uh, October 31st of 2016, uh, but before that he was very active in the field of research, consulting, and business development. 
Um, he's completed a degree in history, political science, and Canadian studies. Uh, a master's in environmental studies with a focus on indigenous knowledge uh, and a major research paper entitled The Traditional Rights of Ways of the Walpole Island First Nation. Uh, he is a Métis scholar who has also published, uh, he has been published in numerous books, articles, magazines, uh, and he is of Métis descent with ancestors attached to Métis script applications and currently resides in Toronto. So welcome, Paul Emile. Uh, last but not least, I'm delighted to introduce you as well to Sunshine Tenasco. Uh, Sunshine joins us uh, as a First Nations mommy of four funny kids, uh, and potentially we might see them today <laughs> if we have some, some additional guests uh, from the Kitigan Zibi of Anishinaabeg uh, area. She is a social entrepreneur who believes that business is an exciting place um, where people can create positive change. Sunshine recently launched Her, Her Braids, um, which is a business that aims to create awareness about the issue of clean drinking water in First Nations communities through beaded pendants. Her Braids has committed to donating 10% of their profits to the David Suzuki Foundation, uh, the Blue Dot Movement. Um, and she's also the CEO of Powwow Pitch, and that's what she'll really be speaking to um, after our roundtable sessions today, um, which aims to give Indigenous entrepreneurs the platform to showcase their entrepreneurial endeavors um, with a chance to win cash and mentorship. Uh, so Sunshine really hopes to help cultivate the culture of entrepreneurship within Indigenous communities, and we're really excited to talk a little bit about the Powwow Pitch um, initiative later th this afternoon, in addition to really profiling um, Indigenous entrepreneurs from across the country um, during our Canadian Export Challenge. So lots of fantastic uh, pitch opportunities coming your way from both Sunshine and the CXE program. Uh, so without further ado, um, I will pass things over to uh, Todd. So we're really delighted um, to, to have Todd speak on behalf of EDC. Uh, and so we'll ask um, Todd if you'd like to share your screen. We'll begin with your presentation now. Great. Well, thanks very much, uh, Kayla. Uh, well, Alan. Hello, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. Gwei, Madal Waliak. I'll start sharing my screen. Bear with me, I'm not a Zoom expert. Uh, just to uh, check here, can everyone see the, uh, the presentation okay? You're all great, Todd. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thanks very much. Um, so I'll get started. Um, so, so that's me, as Kayla mentioned, uh, National Lead uh, for Indigenous Exporters at uh, EDC. Um, this is a relatively new, uh, a new position at uh, EDC. I started in this role back in September of uh, 2019, which now seems like eons ago. Um, though I've been at EDC uh, coming up on my uh, 23rd year in a couple of weeks. Um, really, uh, this, this lead was uh, created because we recognize that the EDC had a lot of products, a lot of services uh, that we think uh, indigenous companies can, can tap into and use to grow their uh, export business. So we did a um, kind of a strategic review of our uh, programs at some external consultants. We consulted a lot with the indigenous business uh, community. And so part of that now was to create this role and, and we're now in the process of kind of building out our indigenous business uh, plan. And you'll see a little bit of that uh, uh, today. So pretty uh, busy agenda as, um, as Kayla mentioned. Um, really uh, what I'm going to do today, it's going to be fairly high level uh, presentation uh, given, given the time and, and, and the topic, uh, but I'm hoping to uh, you know, get you started in the right direction and, and leave you with enough information and access to resources uh, so that you can start uh, sort of exploring and research if you are interested in exporting and, and starting to build uh, uh, your own uh, export plan, and also try to give uh, you know people an under understanding of those resources and an understanding of some of the challenges uh, around exporting. Uh, it's like anything, you know, in, in life it's not always easy, but uh, the rewards can be quite uh, quite uh, significant. Uh, as Kayla mentioned, we will be uh, providing a copy of this presentation as well as a uh, a more extensive list of the resources and all the uh, the internet web links. So I wouldn't be too concerned about trying to get uh, stuff uh, stuff down through the uh, through the presentation. So first, just let me give you a little bit of background on uh, on EDC, who we are, what we do. Uh, we are a, uh, a federal crown corporation. 
Uh, we're financially independent and we actually make money for, for the government, or as we say at EDC, the shareholder, we have one, one shareholder which is basically the, the, the taxpayer. And in essence, our mandate is really to uh, help Canadian companies grow their international business. And we do that through two basically prime man, uh, mandates. Uh, one is to reduce risk um, and basically take that risk of exporting, selling to international buyers and putting it on our books. And also the second one is it is really increasing access to financing, increasing access to capital, working capital. So at the core, that's the two, two things uh, that we do. And we do that through four different areas. And uh, the first one is financing. So as it says here, help Canadian companies get access uh, to capital. And one of our key programs there is really um, our loan guarantee programs. So we actually work with Canadian banks and financial institutions and we will provide a guarantee on the credit loans that they extend to uh, to their clients. And having that kind of backing from a AAA rated uh, you know, Canadian government entity really allows banks to, to you know, provide those loans and, and those lines of credit to perhaps maybe to you know, areas and, and sectors and companies that they you know, would probably be a little hesitant to, uh, to do that. Um, second is insurance, so, you know, Exporting and selling uh, outside of Canada and you know, often inside of Canada as well can be uh, can be a risky business. We have a number of uh, products that can basically protect uh, your sales. And the most popular uh, product we have, and I'll talk about this later, is accounts receivable insurance. So we will actually cover your sales against loss uh, to any number of uh, any number of, of things that can happen when when you're operating in international markets. Uh, more recently, uh, recently being the last you know three four years, we started to invest a lot more in our knowledge uh, products. As you know, companies have told us, our clients have told us that yes, you know the financing, the insurance, all the financial products uh, are very important. But it's also the knowledge. Uh, increasingly, that knowledge is becoming more important as trading, investing, exporting, importing becomes uh, more complex. So we have a full suite of the. Uh, uh, knowledge products available on our website and in partner with partnership with other organizations uh, you know, how to export how to manage cash flow uh, how to um, uh, you know uh, uh, set up for e-commerce a whole range of, uh, of, of things that we uh, you know we try to do to help uh, companies uh, grow their export business um, and again you know having that knowledge is, a, is another way of you know being prepared and, and you know being prepared is also, you know, like financial insurance, it's also another form of uh, kind of risk uh, mitigation. And then finally, uh, uh, connections. Uh, so we have a business connections program where we actually introduce Canadian companies to large international buyers. And um, we have a, a link on our website where companies can go up and reg register for that and give kind of a, uh, some information on their company, the products and goods and services that they sell. And then you know we can look at linking linking you uh, potentially to a, to a foreign buyer that who then provides us with their procurement information, their procurement needs, so we can kind of do that matchmaking uh, matchmaking link. I know I'm simplifying it a little bit here, but that's in essence uh, what uh, what we do. So as I mentioned, um, you know over the past year or so, we've started really taking all of the, all of these um, um, you know products we have, financial products and services. And really uh, making sure we can bring those products into the indigenous uh, business uh, uh, community. And we do that uh, basically through a partnership approach, uh, engaging with the indigenous business community, trying to understand their needs, uh, uh, their challenges, and then taking that information and, and making sure our products are relevant for indigenous uh, companies. And we do that, as I mentioned, through, uh, through really through a, a partnership approach. Uh, one of them being here today with Paul Emil from CCAB. We've been working closely with uh, with CCAB, other you know, other Indigenous uh, organizations as well, like ITAC, the Indigenous Tourism Association, uh, NACA, the National Aboriginal Capital Corporations Association, uh, Can Do, and and yes, also Indigenous Services uh, Canada. So we're uh, that kind of looking at taking that broader international trade ecosystem. And you know, introducing indigenous business into that, and really, uh, you know, making uh, making those products and services more accessible and more uh, more relevant uh, for for indigenous companies. 
you know, that's part of what we're doing here today as well. And right? you know, hopefully getting some feedback from you guys and also, you know, letting you know who we are, what we do as well. So I thought I would just give a little bit of, bit of uh, background on uh, sort of the profile of Indigenous businesses uh, in, in Canada. Um, and in terms of um, resources here, uh, a lot of this information comes from a report I'm sure that Paul Emile is quite familiar with. Uh, it was uh, produced um, mid last year by CCAB and the uh, Global Affairs Canada, looking at uh, essentially sort of the a survey of uh, SME, small and medium sized enterprise, uh, Indigenous owned enterprises uh, in, in Canada. Uh, there's a couple of things that, I won't get into all the details here, but there's a couple of things that, that really uh, um, um, stand out here. One, uh, is it's, it's a growing uh, business community. It's very dynamic, very diverse, uh, operating across pretty much all sectors of Canada. It's a big contributor to the Canadian economy, more than $30 billion uh, annually. Uh, most of the companies are, are smaller, you know, micro, tiny, small companies. Uh, that's not really unique because because the Canadian business um, uh, Canadian businesses businesses in general follow that same profile. We're you know close to 99% of all of our businesses in Canada are small and medium size. So we see that same uh, same profile here for Indigenous uh, companies. But I think what's really uh, re really uh, uh, stands out here is the uh, there's definitely significant export uh, potential uh, here. Um, can you guys see, I just want to do a check. Can you see the video onto the side or should I look at closing that? Uh, can you see the full PowerPoint screen? Yep, we can see the full PowerPoint screen, Todd. Okay, so you can't see, okay. Because I'm, I'm seeing something a little bit different. Sorry about that. Uh, okay. Yeah, so what we're, we're showing here is that, uh, you know, if you look at um, um, sort of current uh, export profile of indigenous companies, uh, we, we see that about one quarter are already uh, exporting. So that kind of gives us a, a good base. Uh, but also what uh, what's interesting here is that uh, so more, more than half of all indigenous uh, entrepreneurs companies uh, are operating in businesses with a very significant high uh, export potential. So we think that's uh, kind of, you know, uh, 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 sort of the potential kind of, you know, the, the potential for growing all the exports are, are significant. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, you know, show some of those, uh, some of those numbers for a little bit of context for the rest of the presentation. So why export? So you may ask yourself, why not export? Uh, um, I guess one thing is that, you know, a lot of the research that we've done and other organizations have done uh, um, show that there are many, many benefits uh, from exporting. One is you're getting access to a much larger, bigger market. Canada represents less than 2% of the global market. Um, so again, having that access uh, is, is, is key. Um, increased diversification in your sales and, and customer base, you generate more revenue. And on average, exporters will earn 121% more revenue compared to their domestic uh, counterparts. It creates a more resilient and sustainable business model. It reduces the risk and impact of economic uh, downturns. Again, it's just diversification. You're not putting all of your eggs in, in, in one basket. Uh, we also see that uh, companies that export more typically pay higher wages. They employ more skilled workers. Their business models are more sustainable, more resilient. Uh, and also with that exposure to international markets, uh, exposure to international companies, uh, you get access to global technologies, best practices that you can then bring back into your own um, business or your own community, your own uh, work plan. And typically we see exporters are also more, more innovative in terms of uh, their productivity, number of, uh, number of products, uh, number of services uh, they, they sell. So who is an exporter? Um, you know, to try to bust a few myths here. You know, most people uh, would think, uh, you know, a lot of the audiences I speak to think that exporting is only for large companies. Uh, you know, there's a lot of names you see in, in the news all the time, uh, but uh, typically it's not, uh, you know, many, many small companies are, are exporters. And, um, um, and for, you know, if you look back to the, the data on uh, indigenous exporters, again, a lot of those are smaller companies and that's kind of uh, what you see in a broader business population in, in Canada. So most of our exporters are actually small companies. Um, also, who is an exporter? It's not just, you know, in, in the past, you know, 
to qualify as an export of something that, you know, something physical you could drop on your foot. But increasingly over the last, you know, 15, 20 years, uh, we're seeing a lot of services uh, being exported, um, you know, technology services, all range of different things, uh, um, you know, management services, construction services, uh, the list goes on and on. In fact, uh, our service exports for the country as a whole are growing about twice as fast as, as goods or those physical uh, uh, exports. Uh, and increasingly, we're seeing a lot of companies, you know, the day they, the, the day they come out of the gate, the day they, you know, they first start up, they have that global perspective. And of course, technology allows them uh, uh, to do that. And also, too, you know, uh, I mean, we could be, I could be speaking to exporters here uh, today already. Uh, you know, many companies, uh, you know, often don't realize they are an exporter or part of a, or part of an export uh, supply chain. Um, a couple of areas uh, in, in particular here is the indirect exporter. So if you're selling to a company, you know, maybe let's say a large resource company or any other large company that's a big exporter, you could be selling your goods and services to that company they turn around, incorporate that into their products or, or you know, pass it on and export it to clients outside of Canada. Well, you're a, a, an exporter in the sense that you're an indirect exporter. Uh, also tourism is another area where that's, uh, you know, if you have in international visitors coming in, again, that's, that's an export. And the, uh, you know, the benefit of that is that all of these companies operating in those export supply chains, again, you know, in any sector that's kind of an export focused sector, um, and also the, the tourism side uh, can access all of the EDC products uh, that I talked about previously and that I'll be talking about uh, through the rest of the, uh, the, the presentation. So there's many ways you can, uh, you can start, um, uh, start, your, start exporting. One, you can follow your customers. If you have customers in Canada, they may have operations around the rest of the world. So that's kind of a natural fit. You already know that company. And again, uh, you know, it's it's just you know selling your goods and services to their operations in other uh, locations around the world. And that's something we see uh, quite common. Um, you know, you can you can partner with a uh, another business, a complementary business that may already be exporting, and you you can kind of piggyback uh, with those guys. Um, increasingly, we're seeing a lot of e-commerce, uh, and again, that's where a lot of the services come in. Um, but I would also add that you know e-commerce e is also a, a a channel for selling now, not just, you know, it's not just technology and services, but it's a way of reaching uh, clients and customers uh, in, in foreign countries. Um, and in terms of, um, I should have been mentioning some of the re resources here. Um, so we did a, uh, um, if you go to our website, and this will be in the list of resources uh, that we're, uh, we're supplying to you. Uh, we have a whole series of blog series on e-commerce and, and all the, the steps and processes and, and on how to do that. And we also have uh, links to a recent webinar we did with Shopify and Google uh, in terms of uh, kind of leveraging uh, those e-commerce uh, uh, resources. So all of that uh, will be available in, in that resource uh, um, um, uh, package we're, we're giving you. And I'm including them also in the chat function for now. So if you're interested in getting them um, as we go through this presentation, they're all in the chat function, but it will be distributed afterwards. Great, thanks Kayla. And then there's the other one, the, um, the indirect exporter uh, I was talking about. Uh, and again, it, it's, it's a way of, of, of tapping into that more dynamic, larger uh, market. And uh, remember, we're less than 2% of the global market. Uh, so we have a lot of clients uh, that, all, you know, that we support that are indirect exporters. They might be selling to a, uh, a large forestry company, a mining, energy, manufacturing, or selling to another large service company. It really doesn't, it's kind of agnostic when it comes to the, to the sector. Uh, um, so that's a way of, uh, of, you know, of getting, tapping into those uh, export markets and sort of the dyna dynamism and growth that comes along with that. So keys to successful exporting. Um, uh, again, I'm not gonna go into a whole lot of detail here because there's, a, there's you know, there, there, there can be a lot involved in, in building a sort of a, a business plan or, or kind of you know, what's beyond successful uh, uh, exporting. Uh, it's like any uh, business endeavor, you know, you need lots of knowledge and you need lots of, uh, lots of preparation. Uh, you know, the more you're, you equip yourself, the more, you, the more uh, and the chances are you're, you're setting yourself up for, for success. Uh, Market research uh, is, is critical. Uh, you need to know, uh, you know, you need to know who your competitors are, and, and increasingly, or even more important, you also need to know who your customers are in the target market. 
do you have the right product? Uh, you know, do you have, um, um, you know, the, the uh, are, are you providing the good and service that these customers are, are, are looking for? So that comes to the next one. Uh, you know, you need to stand out from your competitors. And so you want to look at something, how are you providing a unique value proposition to those, to those customers? You know, you don't want to be seen as just selling another widget amongst, you know, that 100 other companies are, are supplying. So you really need to differentiate your product. And to do that, you need to know your product. You need to know, uh, know your service. So a lot of companies tell us, and, and again, this is whether it's the smallest, you know, two or three, four person operation up to larger uh, multinationals. It's really, it's not so much about selling a, you know, a product to, to the client, but really selling them a solution. Um, and, and showing them that, you know, by buying our product, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's adding value to that, to that company's own business, uh, business model. Um, also, we have a number of free trade agreements. Uh, they can be pretty complex, uh, but again, there's some good resources to, to, understand, uh, to understand those. Um, so if you look at the free trade agreements we have, we have the, the new one, you know, the CUSMA, Canada, US, uh, and Mexico agreement. That's, you know, the new NAFTA. Um, you know, uh, it hasn't changed a whole lot from, from NAFTA, but, you know, it is what it is. But there are provisions in there for indigenous, uh, indigenous uh, trade. We also have the, uh, the trade agreement with, uh, with Europe. Uh, we also have the trade agreement with the Pacific, uh, the Pacific uh, um, nations. And again, you know, that kind of gives us a, an advantage over uh, companies that don't have those, those agreements. So, you know, it, it's good to, you know, understand, you know, a little bit about these, uh, these free to trade agreements and, and how you can take advantage of those. And we have, um, you know, resources and webinars uh, to do that as well. Uh, and just like in any other thing, you know, when you're, when you're selling into a new country or, or, or you know, meeting, uh, meeting uh, you know, people from a different nation, uh, you know, it, it takes take time to understand that culture and that goes a long way. Uh, and I guess, you know, equally important in all of this is having a good market entry plan, uh, you know, understanding, um, uh, you know, the market that you're going into, does your product meet that? What are the uh, um, sort of, standards and rules and regulations and legal infrastructure of that market that you really need to understand uh, you know does your product uh, meet local standards uh, or does it need to be tweaked a little bit uh, is your service uh, something that uh, again uh, uh, it, it is in demand in that uh, in that market and of course supporting all of this i mean none of this will work if you don't have the human capital you know the capacity and the wherewithal to you know to do all of this and of course, you also need the financial muscle, the financial capital to, uh, uh, to support all that. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, uh, over the next few minutes. But I just want to make, uh, make another point before I uh, uh, move on. Uh, so, you know, when it comes to exporting international trade, there's nothing new for indigenous companies. And they've, you know, we've always been traders. So I found this, uh, this map uh, on, on, uh, online, and it shows pre-Columbian continents, con continental trade routes and uh, it's estimated to be around 1450. So you see all these green lines uh, that, are, that are trade uh, links that go all over, all over the continent, all over Turtle Island, uh, so, so to speak. So, you know, this kind of uh, international trade is really nothing new. It's almost like a return to, uh, a return to our roots and, and you know, looking beyond our, our immediate uh, kind, of, kind of customers. And we all know the stories, you know, where you know, so you see the Eastern Woodland uh, uh, nations, uh, you know, often have, uh, you know, through, you know, through the mid mid continent, you often see, uh, you know, pottery and silver and, and copper from Mexico and vice versa. You know, the the the, the, the stone tools, the uh, the chert from Labrador, probably the best, you know, stone for making uh, stone tools. You found all along the eastern seaboard in the United States. So this international trade is is really nothing new. Uh, I uh, just wanted to uh, just throw that out there. So obviously, you know, if, if you're going to uh, start exporting, having a good export plan uh, as a roadmap is, is, is critical. Um, before I get into that, um, you know, many, uh, many uh, people on this call will certainly know that Indigenous entrepreneurs uh, face some unique challenges uh, when they're looking at growing their business and certainly when they're looking at uh, international trade. A lot of those challenges are the same as any you know, small or medium-sized company, uh, you know, access to capital and, and financing, uh, 
the whole range of challenges that come along with uh, you know building a business plan moving into a, into a new market. There are some unique um, 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 uh, challenges or issues that, that indigenous companies uh, have to deal with. Uh, one is that you don't see that uh, as deep a relationship with sort of the mainstream uh, financial uh, banks and other financial institutions. Uh, many smaller companies uh, you know, are dealing with uh, uh, sort of geographic remoteness, um, sort of that lack, lack of connectivity that's, that's needed. So that's a, that's a challenge. Um, management capacity, uh, sometimes a, a challenge as well. Uh, again, it's just that not having that experience or, 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 or background uh, of, of building a successful export-oriented business, access to skilled workers. And we see a lot of these in, in, in non-Indigenous companies as well. Of course, then there's the whole uh, uh, issue around sort of the socioeconomic conditions and historical context uh, kind of layered over that. And, uh, uh, it, you know, we all know uh, what those issues are and we don't uh, spend a whole lot of time on those today. There is one um, thing that comes that, that you go back uh, here if you're looking at uh, yeah sort of building an export plan. It's really about uh, assessing your company's readiness. Um, um, you know, again, do you have the uh, the capacity? Do you have the uh, the wherewithal, the, the, the management, the financial uh, uh, support, the management support to actually start going into uh, uh, into uh, into export markets. Um, you know, assess opportunities for your, for the, the company to sell abroad. Again, this is all about market research, understanding your market and understanding your product if it meets uh, meets that market. Uh, understanding local rules, regulations, standards, you know, the cultural issues uh, around that. Uh, and there's a number of resources that we can provide to uh, to help you with that through EDC and through some of our, our partners. Uh, another one, um, again, that's uh, something that's uh, that's becoming increasingly uh, uh, useful and relevant is getting a supplier certification. And I know Pauli Mill can probably uh, uh, speak to that in terms of uh, the CCAB program for supplier certification. Again, it just gives you uh, that much more recognition in the marketplace. And there's also organizations now that recognize sort of uh, those certifications at an international level. And you've also got to have a strategy that kind of anticipates the challenges, gives you that flexibility to uh, you know, to sort of make changes on 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 the, on the fly. Uh, fifth one here, I think, is probably the most uh, most important, and I'll talk about that one uh, next. But it's also about kind of you know just keeping track, measuring your results, and adjusting as you go along, and just you know keeping track of, of how everything is going. Is this working? Is this not working? Uh, and that kind of thing, because you know you really need to, uh, you know, data and information is important. You really need to sort of kind of measure your 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 performance uh, over time. So when you uh, look at you know building a business plan or an export plan going into the export markets, there's a whole range of, of things that that you need to look at. And I know this can be you know quite daunting when you look at all of, all of this. Uh, and that's why I say I mean you know the uh, uh, you know going into the export markets it does take work, but the rewards can be quite uh, quite significant. Uh, and one of the links I, I put in uh, on a resource uh, thing was a, a link to uh, uh, success stories of companies that have used EDC products to grow their business. You know, we, I've seen companies that started off with three or four employees grow into 20, 25 employees, and that came from having that larger international uh, customer uh, database. So resources, you know, financial, definitely important, risk mitigation, you know, insurance against different kinds of, of, of losses and, and you know, potential things that, that, can, that can happen. And I'm going to touch on that a little bit. All the logistics, uh, the, the shipping behind that, the customs uh, and border, uh, you know, customs brokerage borders. Market information, that's where a lot of, a lot of re, your research comes in. You know, use technology to your advantage. The human capital, that's kind of you know, the, the, the training and the, uh, you know, giving people the knowledge and the wherewithal to understand how to trade. Um, and of course, you, know, you need to, in, in some sectors, you need to invest in you know, physical equipment if you're manufacturing or if you're you know, resource harvesting or even on, on services. And of course, is the whole issue around legal and intellectual property. Uh, and we know for some companies, uh, intellectual property theft is an issue. So really, you know, understanding all of these resources that you need and then bringing all that together can really help focus, uh, focus uh, your plan. 
Um, so one area where you can get started on that is EDC's Export Help Hub. Um, that's one of our knowledge products. You can go there, register for free. You can get a My EDC account. You can pose questions to our uh, international trade experts. You can review a whole list of uh, frequently asked questions that cover some of these uh, these issues. Uh, and it's a good it's a good place to to start. Uh, and uh, you know, posing those questions. And if our trade advisors can't answer a particular question, they often will find one of our partners who can. And one of the key partners we have on that is the uh, is FIT F I T T Forum for International Trade Training. Well, they have a uh, you know they have a very extensive training program. Actually, uh, you can almost it's almost like getting a certification in international trade. You know, you don't need to go to uh, to that uh, extent. Uh, you know, it's like you know, you know many many courses over like a six to, six to one month a year. But they also have kind of uh, little pockets or little uh, packets, I guess, uh, uh, modules covering. You know, relevant issues in international trade. Uh, I think they refer to it as fit light. Um, so it really gives you a good sense of all the terminology and, and all of the issues and logistics and, and sort of um, things you need to know, uh, you know going into, uh, into an export market. And they're an EDC partner and they work uh, qu uh, quite co uh, closely uh, uh, with us on that. So when it comes to financial strategies and uh, kind of preparing for that growth, um, there's three kind of uh, real uh, key areas here and they, and they, they kind of um, uh, link together. I just want to make sure I get my, uh, get my notes right on that. Uh, and so that's, uh, you know, um, accessing capital, your cash flow management and managing risk. And as I say, all three of those are, are really, really tied, uh, uh, tied together. And when it comes to um, kind of the, the risk that you can uh, expose to uh, when you're when you're exporting, many of them are also the same. You know, selling to a client in Canada, right? Uh, you know, non-payment, uh, insolvency, uh, contract disputes, overdue payments, uh, intellectual property theft. Not so much an issue in Canada, but certainly more of an issue outside of Canada. Um, then when you're, you know, so a lot of these issues become a little more pronounced uh, when you're selling in, uh, in, in export markets. You know, think of your, your client uh, you might have in uh, um, where these strange markets are coming from, but it's all good. Um, so you think of sort of clients uh, that you might have in, in uh, you know, we have, you know, we basically support exports to pretty much every country in the world. There's a few that are off limits. You know, North Korea and that, those kinds of things. Uh, but you know, having clients in through Nigeria, Angola, Ecuador, Peru, Vietnam, the whole range of things, right? So you can kind of get a sense uh, where some of the risks are. But typically too, with a lot of these markets, our, our clients actually have, have higher profit margins as opposed to here in Canada. So that's uh, another bonus of, uh, of exporting. So the political risk, you know, government change, war, riots, change in legal framework, you know, uh, change in, in, in laws. Luckily, you know, we have insurance uh, that can protect you against that. There's also then exchange rate risks. Again, you know, we have, uh, we have products that, that, can, that can, can deal with that uh, as, as, you know, as, as part of that uh, kind of managing your overall. To manage your overall all business. So one of the, the important things here as part of all that is the importance of cash flow, uh, uh, um, sort of cash flow to your business. It's, you know, as you know, cash flow is critical, right? Uh, you know, there's a problem there for a lot of companies, particularly smaller companies. It's matching that, you know, outgoing payments to your incoming uh, receivables, incoming uh, uh, revenue. Um, quite often you get a lumpy revenue but you know you still got all your monthly bills to pay. You still got all of your uh, you know you still got to keep uh, keep the lights on. So that's kind of ma managing that cash flow is 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 critical to uh, uh, to that process. So it kind of gives you that uh, you know managing that that cash flow and trying to stabilize your your revenue that uh, really gives you that that stability. It smooths out those fluctuations. And, and you know, not, it's not always where you can match your uh, receivables with your payments, uh, but that's where the access to the capital comes in. So you know, once you have those, uh, have that funding in place, once you have those lines of credit, uh, you know, from your banks or financial institution, they understand that you know, of course, you know, your, uh, you know, your your payments are coming at some point in your accounts receivable. 
but you know they, they know that uh, you know it can be sporadic lumpy so that's where you know having that uh, that keeping that steady cash flow uh, through access to capital through uh, through financing uh, so you know so taking a proactive approach is always best right and oh, it's always better to be prepared and, and kind of have a, have a good understanding of of, uh, of you know your accounts receivable, your accounts payable. Um, having good numbers around that, you can always look at ways where you can kind of increase your cash or maybe cut you know cut your spending over uh, over there. And as I mentioned here, it's all it's all about thinking that, thinking a few steps ahead. Uh, also, with you know looking out and trying to predict and, and uh, forecasting your your cash flow. Know, maybe build a few scenarios, run different simulations uh, that you can kind of prepare for and mitigate risk. You know, what if you lose uh, one of your, you know, one of your good customers, that kind of thing? What, 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 uh, you know, what would your business model then look like? And there's lots of technology and software out there that uh, that can really help uh, with that. And and, you know, and 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 again, kind of underlying all of this uh, is really having that close and positive relationship with all of your advisors or partners, so to speak, you know, your financial institution, your landlord, your vendors, you know, your, your, your legal uh, support accountants. So having that really good, strong relationship is also a critical um, for any business plan. So when it comes to cash flow, again, uh, it's very important to, uh, to know your numbers, uh, only through, you know, if you don't really have a good sense of what uh, what your business numbers are like it, you, again it's, it's about having that uh, uh, kind of keeping your eyes wide open right uh, and knowing where uh, where, where your, uh, your your money is going out knowing where it comes in it's only then that you can really plan around that uh, I think having a good understanding of, of, the, of the whole range of uh, different government uh, and other programs uh, is important um, you know don't have time to go through them all day. I could be here for the next five hours and I still wouldn't get through them all. Uh, but there's a whole range of different federal programs, provincial programs, uh, the AFIs, Aboriginal financial institutions have some, uh, have some uh, good programs in, in, uh, in place. And don't be afraid of debt. I mean, as I say, it's not necessarily a four letter word. Sometimes debt is necessary. Again, to smooth out that, that cash flow. Um, if you have a new contract, you need to invest in some uh, new equipment or, or input supplies to meet that contract. Uh, so taking on those kinds of working capital loans to support your growth, to support the, uh, the search for new clients, you know, to support new contracts, it, it's, you know, it's critical. Uh, and, and taking on debt in that sense it, it's, is a, uh, you know, can be a positive uh, thing. And again, as I mentioned, planning, you know, doing some scenario planning, and stress testing so you can kind of identify and anticipate and manage and prepare for any risks that come down uh, come that are coming down the pipeline and there's lots of technology out there as well for you know, discounting your cash flows uh, really a way of organizing all the different data that that's coming at you and uh, and kind of giving you a, a much clearer picture a much clearer sense of, of where your business where your revenues where your cash flow where your payments are all kind of uh, coming together where they all fit in. So let's just say a little uh, a diagram we, we, we put together to try to get a, get a sense of, of kind of the process, uh, right? And, and, and in terms of, uh, of raising capital, uh, raising funds. Uh, again, this is part of feeding into that cash flow, uh, forecasting that understanding your, your cash flow. So first, I guess, is really understand what stage uh, is your business in and what are you using the money for? Um, you know, it could be your export plan, it could be investing in, in a new product, a new service, uh, anything, you know, to, to support your business. And what are your options uh, for, for funding? Again, there's a whole range of, uh, of, of things here um, um, that, you know, that you have access to, some more accessible than others. Uh, you, you know, I would say that, uh, you know, uh, you just go to your bank, but for many, uh, you know, smaller, Newer companies, that's often not an option because you don't have that track record, um, you don't have that, that history. So that can be uh, can be a, a challenge for some uh, smaller companies. And again, I'll talk a little bit later. This is where some of the products that EDC and, and others have uh, can can fit in. Um, there's Aboriginal financial institutions. Uh, there's other uh, other uh, sources. The regional development agencies uh, provide uh, different uh, different kinds of uh, funding. Um, there's 
you know, a lot of small companies, as I'm sure some of you know, there's friends, family, uh, that kind of thing uh, that may you know, be willing to support you. And then at the end of the day, there's your own sweat equity, right? Uh, your, your own uh, hard work. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people will use uh, personal credit cards to support, uh, support the business. So there are a range of, of different, uh, different options here. Try to have a sense of what, what the cost of what you're paying for, for this money. Uh, nothing is really, really free. Um, and again, what are the terms and conditions, uh, or payment terms uh, associated with different sources? And at the end of the day, will this really help you grow your business? So it's just kind of keeping all of this uh, in mind when you're, um, when you're really you know, looking at the different sources of funding. Is this really going to help me grow my business? Is this what I need to grow my business? Uh, and again, it's, it's really just uh, you're, you know, trying to get a full, complete picture uh, behind that. So, uh, you know, think, you know, looking at it from, uh, you know, the, the, the capital, the capital side, right? Uh, so a good plan that looks at where you're going with your business, where you're hoping to go with your business, that will help you anticipate your capital and cash flow needs. So if you're looking at, you know, moving, uh, moving uh, into the United, into the U.S. market with, uh, with one of your, you know, with your service or your product, that might be a little different if you're moving in, into Europe or you know, the South American market. So again, it's uh, you know understanding that plan will give you a better sense of, of what you need in terms of capital and uh, and cash flow needs. It's also important that you know that you you do need to ensure you have access to capital to fulfill those contracts. Um, how your work in progress uh, can be financed. Uh, consider insurance for, for risk mitigation. So all, all the different sort of commercial and country risks I mentioned, uh, I mentioned earlier, um, you know, that's, uh, that's an important consideration. Uh, and as you'll see in the next slide or two, um, some of the EDC's products can really take all of that risk and put it on our books and, and reduce the risk for, for, the, for companies. Um, quite often contracts, uh, might, you might need to put up a performance bond or bid bond. Basically, that's uh, you know telling the buyer that uh, if I don't you know if my product or service doesn't meet certain specs or, or you know uh, certain previously agreed to specifications, uh, then you know you're on the hook for that, right? Uh, uh, so again, you can get uh, insurance and bonding uh, to uh, to support that. And of course, there's foreign exchange risk, as as anybody who's ever uh, um, you know dealt with the U.S. dollar knows. Know, that, that a lot of that fluctuation can can have an impact on on your bottom line. Uh, um, you know, sometimes a lower dollar is good if you're selling outside of Canada. Um, it's not always the case. Uh, if if the, a strong dollar can also be useful as well. It depends on your own personal situation, your own your own company's uh, situation. If you're importing a lot of supplies from foreign markets, particularly you know uh, from the United States, and the Canadian dollar is weak. Well, that makes it harder to, you know, to buy those, import those goods. On the flip side, if you're selling them, it's great because it gives you kind of your, your, you know, you're still getting, you're getting more Canadian dollars in your market and your products actually priced cheaper in that market. But again, EDC and, and other uh, um, agencies have, have, have uh, sort of uh, products in place uh, to, to help that. And at the end of the day, you know, having that kind of uh, financing in place, whether it's, uh, you know, through a bank, another financial institution, um, just having it ready and available gives you the uh, sort of the capacity and the wherewithal to jump on opportunities as they arise. So if you're winning that, you know, if you see that you've got a chance to win a new contract and you don't have kind of the financing in place or no one to go to to readily get that kind of financing, uh, then you can, uh, you know, you may lose that contract because you, you know, you're not ready uh, to take that on. So it just makes you more prepared uh, and more able to, uh, to, to jump on opportunities uh, as they come up. And, you know, when it comes to, I guess, you know, it's really not unique to international trade. Uh, at the end of the day, a lot of success is, is about sometimes being in the right place at the right time. Um, but being in the right place in the right time and not being prepared you know, your your chances of, of 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 success are that much lower. But being in the right place in the right time, being prepared to, to uh, take advantage of the opportunity, that you know, at the end of the day, that's really uh, what drives a lot of success uh, in, in international trade. 
just a tad, just being sensitive of our time um, and, and passing things off to Paul Emil. Do you have any final thoughts perhaps? And then maybe uh, these final slides we can distribute to everyone to, to review uh, at home. Yeah, so I'm just going to finish off uh, a couple of slides here. And I'm sorry if I went over time. Um, so really, um, with EDC, we have a couple of products in, in place that we can really help uh, get that access uh, to credit. Uh, one is our loan guarantee program. Traditionally, we have our export loan guarantee, and that's offered in, in, co in partnership with your bank. So really, um, you know, when you go um, to your bank, um, and they will extend credit to you um, based on EDC's loan guarantee. And, that, and quite often, that, that's something that can be put in place very, very quickly, too. So if you go to your bank, I just want a new contract in a foreign market, but I don't have the working capital to meet that contract, the stuff I need for that contract. Well, that's where EDC can step in, provide the guarantee, knowing you have a contract, and, and you know, that will actually uh, allow the bank to extend credit. So again, you, you get access to that capital and meet the contract. The BCAP loan guarantee is a streamlined version of that. That's a little easier more accessible, easier terms uh, in, in response to the COVID-19 uh, 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 crisis. Pretty much the same product, but just a little easier to access. The second one is, is the credit insurance I talked about, where we're actually EBC will provide 90% coverage on your accounts receivable against non-payment. So again, the bank, your bank, financial institution will lend against that insured receivable. So, so again, increases your access to, to capital. And it, the credit insurance it can apply to sales ranging from you know the low thousands, uh, you know, three, four, five thousand dollars, up to multi-million dollar uh, contracts. Having that credit insurance in place gives you that sleep at night comfort, gives your bank the sleep at night comfort, and quite often it also allows you, knowing that your sales are protected against loans, uh, to provide better terms to your customer. And also makes you your product uh, that much more competitive against uh, against computer uh, competitors. All of this information is available on our website. Uh, I just put in a summary here to uh, to kind of uh, you know, the, the steps and, and, and processes involved, and just a bunch of financial resources here and uh, different links to information. Uh, I will end it there. Thanks. Thanks, Todd. And as we mentioned, all of these um, links and resources will be distributed in the follow-up email. So uh, you'll have plenty of time to digest, um, play around, see what resources are going to be most helpful for you. Um, but thank you for all of that fantastic information, Todd. Uh, really, really um, a wonderful package of information. Thank uh, thanks very much. And thanks for the, uh, the time check. Uh... I no had, problem. I should have had my stopwatch there, but uh, <laughs> it's all good. We get excited about exporting. <laughs> We're in the same boat. I do, <laughs> I do too. Um, so next up, um, we have Paul Emil McNabb, um, and so we're going to pass things off um, for that session. Uh, and Paul is joining us from the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business. Um, so Paul, let's jump right into the content that you have to share with our audience. Our audience today. Great. Uh, thank you so much uh, to Startup Canada for allowing me to be here today. Uh, I want to acknowledge the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, um, which I reside today. Um, great. So Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business, who we are, what we do. Um, we've been around a long time, um, over 35 years. Um, we were started uh, back in 1984 by um, business uh, person, entrepreneur, visionary, philanthropist Murray Poffler, who is the founder of Shoppers Drug Mart and the co-founder of the Four Seasons Hotel. And it was his vision really to create an organization that would help build more relationships, business partnerships between um, corporate Canada, business Canada, um, the business community and indigenous um, uh, communities, businesses and entrepreneurs. Um, so we're a national not-for-profit organization. We receive no core government funding. Um, and currently today we have about a thousand members across Canada nationally. Um, so what does that mean? Um, anyone can be a member. Um, about, about mem membership is made of about 65% are indigenous businesses, entrepreneurs, and the development corporations of First Nation, Inuit, Métis communities. Um, and they join CCAB to engage, uh, build more relationships, networking, and they're looking for business opportunities um, with our corporate members who are in turn looking to hire more indigenous businesses in their supply chains and build more uh, relationships, business partnerships and joint ventures. So CCAB provides that national network that helps bring that all together. And how do we do that? Um, great segue into our programs, um, progressive Aboriginal relations, 
um, certified Aboriginal business program, um, tools and financing for Aboriginal businesses, of course, uh, research, um, our events that we do, um, mostly online webinars now, and our CCAB um, business recovery forum event, which will take place on September 16th, um, and our Aboriginal procurement marketplace as well. So, just um, perfect. So, reconciling differences is is a good way um, to start. Um, these are uh, these are conversations I have every day. Um, we help with engagement. So, at an early stage, engagement with Indigenous businesses, the Indigenous businesses, communities, um, and corporate Canada. So, I have conversations daily with organizations that simply don't know where to start, um, and they'd like to begin their process, their journey to build more um, uh, relationships, business partnerships with Indigenous entrepreneurs and communities. So CCAB is kind of that organization that helps um, get, to, get to that point, and it's a good starting point. Um, as I mentioned, engagement is so important. Um, uh, one of our partners at Sodexo did an Indigenous business survey in 2017, so this kind of shows um, uh, kind of the landscape of the Canadian economy and, and shows um, the willingness of, of Canadian businesses, um, obviously with, with reconciliation, TRC 2015, um, CCAB recently uh, released a report a year ago on business and reconciliation. So uh, we pride ourselves in terms of um, the engagement between the Indigenous business community and corporate Canada. And this survey kind of backs up that uh, claim uh, of the willingness uh, of companies to engage. Um, when you talk about the Indigenous economy, I think there's a lot of myths out there. Um, so I think uh, CCAB has been conducting research all the way back, I think 2007 and 8, um, on the state of the Indigenous economy. One of our great partners at TD um, Economics, um, we've, you know, since then we've actually released several research reports and this kind of shows um, um, that Indigenous people, First Nation, Inuit, Métis are contributors to the uh, Canadian uh, economy um, and shows the growth, the size of the economy um, and the potential. So we, we know that's there. Um, and I think this kind of um, goes a long way in terms of um, debunking those myths of, of what certain perceptions are out there about um, Indigenous people and, and the fact that they are real contributors to the Canadian economy. And again, um, Kayla, I believe you had shared the link uh, before in the chat box. So all of these reports are available at ccab.com slash research if you're interested. There's lots of reports there on everything here. Um, so government procurement. Uh, procurement is very important. Um, this kind of shows um, in terms of the government. Um, I'll get into that a little later, but CCAB has been uh, since really 2017-18 been a huge advocate for government stepping up and um, providing more procurement opportunities. So um, this is kind of the average procurement uh, through PSAB of what they do. So um, what we're saying is, is spend um, 5% um, in terms of total federal government spend on Indigenous businesses. And, you know, like again, um, the great research that we do, we should, you know, the capacity is definitely there, 24%. Uh, we're not saying 24%, we're saying five based on the population, but um, this again uh, proves that Indigenous businesses do have um, the capacity to do the work. So it's really about breaking down those, those barriers and, and, not, and not stopping really at all. Um, never never um, giving up in terms of what CCAB, you know, what we do, our goals and, and, and being the voice of Indigenous business. Um, so in terms of private sector procurement, this kind of shows here, Fort Mackay First Nations, many communities. This is just one example, but this shows kind of the relationships that um, a First Nation, Métis or Inuit community or their development corporation um, can have in terms of the business partnership relationship, equity stakes and projects has on a community, Fort Mackay First Nation, average annual income 73,000, higher than the province of Alberta and uh, uh, Canada. Um, so really, you know, why procurement? I think um, CCAB, we, you know, we have obviously a long history of working with Indigenous entrepreneurs. Um, really, it was back in 2017 where we kind of 
um, looked at the things that we were doing and, and thought that this was kind of the best way. And it was, you know, what our indigenous entrepreneurs businesses were telling us, you know, we want more opportunities. We want more business opportunities, networking. Um, so this is kind of what they're, they're looking for in terms of, of different opportunities from the private sector um, and CCAB. So this is um, from, from the survey results in 2017. In 2018, we launched our official procurement initiative called Supply Change, um, which is essentially an Aboriginal procurement strategy focused on highlighting the opportunities and the value of the Aboriginal um, economy and procurement relationships uh, with a focus on connecting Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal businesses. So in terms of um, the five steps, recruiting leaders from the business community to serve as Aboriginal procurement champions, um, in the Aboriginal procurement campaign, national media campaign, um, creating Canada's largest directory of certified Aboriginal businesses, which are 51% owned and operated controlled First Nation, Inuit and Métis companies. The Aboriginal procurement marketplace is an online portal that acts as a two-way directory between companies and procurement representatives from uh, our Aboriginal procurement champions group um, with our partners at uh, Tealbook, which is the supplier diversity network um, that we use. So, Currently, I think we're up uh, over 60 champions right now. So um, certified Aboriginal businesses, when they join CCB, they get certified, they get access to this procurement uh, um, portal. And here's the marketplace. As I said, acts as a two-way directory procurement. Um, this is, uh, you know, it gives a chance. All CCAB cab companies will have a marketing profile. So this is, you know, you're asking about how uh, can we help uh, Indigenous businesses that export? Well, this is a great way to um, show all the qualities, show uh, strengths of your business. And, um, you know, I get asked, CCAB, we get asked to identify whether it's the World Indigenous Business Forum, other events, um, certified Aboriginal businesses that do export. So this is a great way to showcase your capabilities as a company um, through the CCAB network, uh, whether that's online, publicly in our directory, or through the marketplace as well. Um, because, like again, I, I get asked um, daily from organizations that are looking to procure more Indigenous uh, business. Um, just shifting gears a little bit, um, uh, Progressive Aboriginal Relations, one of our uh, major programs at CCAB, um, been around for nearly 20 years. Um, we have about well over 100 companies, um, which essentially is a corporate social responsibility program with an emphasis on Aboriginal relations across the, an organization or a company. Um, it's a phased approach uh, with committed certified um, levels verified by independent third party. Um, one of the key, you know, there's four pillars, but I'll just say one of the key pillars um, in terms of uh, CCAB providing a roadmap, and a, a roadmap and a framework for organizations is procurement and business development. So we help organizations uh, build in their indigenous spend um, and to be able to track, to spend, track that spend um, and know what they're spending and you know, like, for example, I think it was in 2019, Suncor had spent um, went well over $700 million. Um, in terms of the research, um, uh, you know, like, like I said before, we've been doing research uh, since 2008. Um, I started in the CCAB research department in 2013. Really pr provides the, the foundation, um, looks at the opportunities and challenges, it helps track, um, collect data and really, you know, help uh, assist Indigenous entrepreneurs um, in identifying, as, as Todd mentioned, um, you know, uh, CCAB identified uh, from the get-go, you know, access to capital, financing, um, use of government programs, um, do Indigenous businesses hire Indigenous employees, where do they do business, um, where, you know, do they export? So um, the research department has allowed us to um, really go across the entire country interviewing uh, indigenous entrepreneurs, private entrepreneurs, and the development corporations um, to bring back that expertise and knowledge where we can then communicate that back. Um, it helps um, shape policy decisions. Um, and actually it's been um, extremely collaborative and um, our research has grown leaps and bounds and has given us that, that ability to uh, really provide that, that value and thought leadership um, to the indigenous business community. Um, so one of the projects that, um, one of the many, I, I've lost track of all the research we've done in the last uh, few years, but uh, uh, from the Promise and Prosperity, um, which I led back in 2015-16, um, where we interviewed um, over 1,100 Indigenous companies, um, nearly 650 participants were Indigenous 
small medium enterprises. Um, so we did uh, one of the questions uh, and some of the questions posed were about whether they export. Um, so you know, looking at uh, about their destination markets to determine whether or not they export internationally as well. And uh, Todd had uh, mentioned this uh, report as well um, in his slide earlier. Um, some of the key findings, um, approximately 24% of Indigenous SMEs export, over one in five Indigenous SMEs export to the U.S. Um, and one uh, to non-U.S. overseas markets as well. Higher education attainment by firm leaders associated with higher tendency to export. Indigenous SME owners with on average at least five years of experience are more likely to access international markets. Exporting Indigenous SMEs report financing and connectivity in terms of infrastructure are related as important obstacles to growth at a rate compared to non-exporting Indigenous SMEs. And, and finally, the use of social media tools by Indigenous SMEs owners appeared one of the main factors supporting their interna interna internationalization efforts. So we look at the, right now, look at the, you can see on the slide, the breakdown of Indigenous exporters by export destination, uh, non-exporters, 75%, exporters, 24%. And then you look at the breakdown of, of where they were exporting to the US um, and international markets as well. So what I'll, what I'll say um, uh, to conclude with um, some points, how CCAB can help. Um, there was a question earlier in the chat box about shipping. So how can CCAB help? Um, how can you become a CCAB certified Aboriginal business? Um, you know, expensive shipping. So um, one of the ways CCAB is doing that is through, um, uh, through the research, actually, we, we launched our tools and financing for Aboriginal business program, uh, TFAP, um, uh, which is an online plat platform of different tools and services. So through the operations services platform, um, our great uh, partners at UPS Canada. Um, so all CCAB certified Aboriginal businesses receive 50% uh, off um, shipping. Um, so we're really happy about that. Um, so it's these types of partnerships, I think, and, and you know, obviously um, uh, the official partnership we have now with Export Development Canada, Business Development Canada, you know, it's these types of, of relationship building exercises, being collaborative. Um, CCAB can be that network that can help. Um, so really, you know, right now our objective is to continue that work um, and to provide um, our certified Aboriginal businesses the necessary, um, you know, whether that's through pr practical business tools, services, um, the CCAB network, um, or the procurement marketplace. So whatever you're looking for uh, as a growing business, CCAB, is there to help. Um, obviously we've done, you know, a, a tremendous amount of work since COVID-19. Um, we did release some new research on how COVID-19 was um, affecting Indigenous businesses. And it's, it's, it's you know, it's really, it's, it's really challenging and scary uh, to read some of those, those results. Um, you know, CCAB has been heavily um, involved in that in terms of the initial uh, money that went out to the Aboriginal financial institution. So, um, as an organization, we're doing everything we can, we can um, to support, um, you know, a growing, prosperous, uh, prosperous Indigenous economy and um, supporting Indigenous entrepreneurs. So, thank you, uh, Marseille Miigwech, and I look forward to continuing on with the session. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Polly Meal. Uh, and thank you for all of the information that, that we received. I know to, to all of our audience members, uh, it's quite a lot to digest. So don't take it <laughs> sort of all in it in this exact moment. Um, you will have some time to, to sort of uh, review the information and ask some follow up questions with directed uh, um, advice and support that we can get from both organizations. Um, so we are running a little bit behind on time. So we're going to consolidate our next breakout session. Um, so essentially, everybody on the call at the moment will be broken out into a different breakout room. You don't need to have your video on. You can speak verbally um, and just engage uh, uh, using the audio function on your computer. Uh, but this is really to provide everybody on a call with one, a networking opportunity. Um, and two, if we focus on the, the key question that we're trying to identify is what are the main challenges that you're currently facing um, in your export journey? Um, is it lack of information? Is it specific questions that you have? Um, how can you leverage the various support functions that we have on, on today's call um, through this, this roundtable session? So what we're going to do on, in a moment on your screen, you will be assigned to a various uh, to a specific group, uh, and then you'll be able to ask specific questions and really talk about um, that that challenge um, uh, that you might be facing. So um, in each group, 
Um, you'll be asked to introduce yourself and your company and which market you're currently in. Um, and then for now, just because we're, we're running a little bit tight on time, identifying the top challenge that you are currently facing. Um, so Angela, uh, my colleague, will send us into these various uh, breakout groups momentarily, uh, and then you can jump right in there. Then afterwards, um, we will be returning back and hearing from Sunshine um, to discuss powwow pitch um, and some additional opportunities um, uh, in terms of pitch funding. So I think we're ready to go. Okay, hello everyone. Welcome back to the, the main session. We hope that you had uh, a great but very lightning fast uh, round table session and that you received some either valuable information, made a, a good contact. Um, I know my session, I learned a lot uh, in that short period of time. So thank you everyone for participating uh, across those lines. So to wrap up for the next 10 minutes of our, our session, so we will try to get to complete as close to 2.30 as possible, um, I'm going to pass things over to Sunshine Tenasco, um, who is the founder and lead of Pow Wow Pitch. Um, so I'll let Sunshine, I'll let you describe what the program is, some suggestions you have for Indigenous entrepreneurs as they navigate, um, you know, the, the new pitching environment and now navigating digital pitching, um, what you're seeing within uh, your organization, with the entrepreneurs that you with on, deal with on a daily basis. Basis, uh, and any advice that you have for uh, our entrepreneurs today. So over to you, Sunshine. There we go. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kayla, for having me. Um, I love these things. I love speaking with entrepreneurs who get, uh, get down and dirty and really just know how to, to take the leap. So um, yeah, so Pow Wow Pitch is uh, an indigenous organization. It's a sort of a, a project that I started uh, in its sixth year now, uh, where people, indigenous people who go to powwows get to pitch. They have a 60 second pitch competition, uh, followed by a three hour mentorship uh, program where people shift around, uh, narrowed it down to the top 10 and the top 10 pitch, uh, three minute pitch, two minute Q and A, and I get to give away money that, uh, that we've raised. So it's pretty much that simple. Um, and you know, the perks are, uh, yes, you get micro grants or, uh, that is a perk, but also about, uh, brand recognition. And, you know, we're trying to really trying to create this platform where indigenous entrepreneurs are succeeding and, you know, we're really trying to create this stage for them. So I've done that once a year, as well as usually organizing a conference and or a workshop throughout the year, uh, in the winter months. This year was the first year we were taking it national and we were supposed to take powwow pitch to five powwows across Canada. The reason being, because I get this question a lot, is, you know, we have these other pitch competitions and a lot of Indigenous entrepreneurs are not comfortable going to them. So, you know, if anyone's ever been to a, a pitch competition, have a look around and tell me how many Indigenous people you actually think you remember seeing. My guess is there it's slim to none. And so when we keep it at a powwow, um, you're in a familiar place. There's already entrepreneurship happening all around the powwow. So if you've been to one, you know, there's the drum, the dancers around, and then all the vendors. So you have your food vendors and all your other vendors. And so that's who we're really trying to help is the grassroots small businesses. Um, and they are businesses. They just, uh, you know, they just call themselves different words, but it's the same thing. Um, and you have to have your cash flow and you have to have all those other good things. And it's, it just comes to, uh, you know, people who have been on the powwow trail naturally, although it's not specifically, you know, just for those businesses. Um, it's sort of a way to reach indigenous people where, where we are comfortable. Um, so yeah, this year, that was the plan. Enter COVID. Everyone, everyone had their own life changes because of COVID. Uh, so we've taken it online this year, which I think is super, you know, the silver lining is, is really, um, is re really is a silver lining in that we're going to be able to reach people who can't travel. We're going to be able to reach, you know, Inuit people uh, and, and all this. So uh, we're really happy about it. The deadline to submit a, a 60 second pitch online is uh, this Friday, the 14th. So yeah, that's pretty much powwow pitch in uh, a nutshell. Um, and the reason that I started it is because I'm sort of going to go all the way back here. 
is because I, I'm a high school teacher by trade and I went on Dragon's Den on a whim because I made these baby moccasins in Ziploc bags. And I said, you know, I, I think I can do better than Ziploc bags and I need a machine and I'm just gonna go for it. And so I went on Dragon's Den and that sort of shifted my entire life's path, like everything, you know, changed there. And two dragons did invest in me. Um, and and the perfect the reason I went was because I wanted an industrial sewing machine. Anyways, fast forward, then I got these so super ugly boxes made, but I thought they were the most beautiful thing you've ever seen in your life. Terrible. Like anyways. And then I had these more for a higher end boutique, um, you know, had these made. Uh, and so that sort of growth and being my own boss, uh, being able to be home with my children, I now have four. Uh, was so empowering. And, uh, you know, I went to a couple of other jobs uh, throughout and uh, it's, uh, it's just something else being able to create things from passion, uh, you know, with excitement. And uh, yeah, so um, then when I started Pow Wow Pitch, I also started Her Braids. And so the reason being is that I, I feel like that Dragon's Den um, recognition or uh, you know, people seeing what, what my baby moccasin business was like and really encouraging me, uh, was so fulfilling, inspiring, like all those high energy words. That's what dragons that did for me. And, and I just really want other indigenous entrepreneurs to feel that too. Like, Hey, someone's believing in you and we want to help you and we want to showcase your business and we want to give you this you know what little we can but you know this year we have a ten thousand dollar prize um so yeah that's sort of the the idea behind dragon's den and people ask me about pitching we're going to bring it back to pitching um nobody i didn't know what pitching was when i went on dragon's den google your number one friend um what i can say is that be very clear with what you're going to do with the money. So people will say, well, I want a cutting press or that, cause that's what I wanted. Or I want a sewing machine. Uh, if you're not in that business, how do I know what a cutting press is? What is this $10,000 really going to do for you? So when you're pitching, be very clear in what you want. Be, and, and, and say this cutting press is going to cost me $7,000 shipping included. And the other $3,000, I'm going to hire a graphic designer for ABC. And that way, I don't even have to ask you a question. I know you have your, you know, your financials sort of in mind. Um, and, the, and the idea with pitching, why they call it an elevator pitch, is that hypothetically, if you walk into an elevator and you're with someone influential or an angel investor or someone who has just money to toss out, you have from your floor to their floor probably 60 ish seconds how are you going to convince them to invest in you so be clear in what you are as a business and where you're going and i honestly think the best advice that uh, i've heard other people give is you're going to do this anyways yes this money might help you get there faster and it's going to help you on your path but the judges what they want to know is this is where you're you've been but where you're going um, and, and, and how that, like that, it's not like I would like to, this is no, it's not in dream world. This is what I am doing and do it and figure out a way. And so, uh, just to be, uh, you know, organizing power pitch and to be a part of that journey in some teeny tiny way with a prize, it's just, uh, I, I super appreciate it. And, uh, and I love, I love organizing it. I love it. <laughs> so that's it for me. I don't know if anyone has questions. Amazing. Thank you, Sunshine. Yeah. So you're welcome to uh, ask some questions in the chat function. We'll also be um, including information about Pow Wow Pitch in the follow-up email. So really, really encourage everyone to participate in the program if they'd like to, now that you can connect digitally from anywhere, which is exactly a silver lining, as, as Sunshine mentioned. Um, and great prep as well if you're looking to get involved in the Canadian Export Challenge. For our startup category, um, you're welcome to be very early stage, um, looking to navigate an export environment um, and, and really Really, it would be incredible to have, um, you know, an Indigenous entrepreneur represented on that final stage uh, in the grand finale. So we really want to make sure it's as inclusive of a program as possible um, and that we have leaders from across Canada, truly across the entire country. Um, so 
Thank you to all of our workshop presenters today. Thank you, Sunshine. Thank you, Paul Emile. And thank you, Todd, uh, for spending your, your afternoon or, I guess, evening, Todd, with us <laughs> out in Newfoundland. Um, we will be following up with all the session materials after today. Um, we encourage you to stay connected with those that you engage with during the breakout sessions and follow up with our various partners. Um, and really excited about seeing, um, you know, hopefully this information come to life in supporting or scaling your business globally. Um, so thank you everyone for, for connecting. Feel free to reach out to the Startup Canada team if you have any questions about additional programming we'll be offering. Um, and we hope that you have a fantastic rest of your afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Perfect. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank